So uh, my charge is to talk about a radically customer-centric airline. Well, that title gave me pause because it does speak directly or indirectly to the sometimes dismal state of the airline industry, particularly in the States. After all, if you're going to start an airline, what should it be except radically customer-centric? What, what, why else would you do it? But I do believe that if a founder tries this as a premise and does all the other stuff correctly, that success is more likely than not. So I'll highlight some brief thoughts on a couple of focus points. I'll start with the hardware. may seem obvious. Let's start with the fleet. Let's start with the aircraft. Buy, borrow, or beg, but try to get new airplanes. Old airplanes are cheap. They're very, very tempting. And you're going to have your CFO pounding you on the head saying, old, 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 we'll just clean them up. But the fuel costs, the reliability, the lower maintenance costs, the modern uh, aspects that they have will make it worth your while. They also smell good. <laughs> Stick to a single fleet for a very long time if you can. There's one famous airline that's going to come up in a little while that went to a second fleet type. It wasn't this guy's decision. But it slowed them down. They're still a fine airline, but uh, stick to a single fleet type and try to get a model that's scalable, A319, 320, 321, so that you can mix and match and uh, match your plane to your, your mission. <clears throat> so why is this hardware customer-centric in the first place? Well, because the layout is consistent, and that's important, certainly at the beginning, and the experience will be the same. And human beings like familiarity, and they really like consistency. The second is technology, a word that you've heard 30 or 40 times today, and we'll probably have 400 by the end of the day. I'll talk mostly about customer facing, but I'm still amazed uh, that this is an area that I think traditional behaviors prevail. When I advise airlines, which I still do occasionally, I often tell them to forget the website. That's how I get their attention and concentrate on the mobile app. Uh, that either gets their attention or you get thrown out of the room. So I think today in Atlanta Airport, I probably read this in Skift, but I know it to be true, 75% of all people will be carrying a smartphone that's usually on. And 5%, maybe in the long time since I've read it, 60 or 90 days, it might be 6%, it might be 7%. But no more than 7% of those phones are used for anything to do with the travel ribbon. That's changing by the minute, and the iPhone 6, of course, will accelerate it. One of the things that I used as a filter when starting Virgin America from scratch, right here in this town, in fact, before we moved to San Francisco, was ease of use. I said it so often that if I just went, e the whole team would shout, ease of use. Uh, it was the first thing that I said. The first thing I said, does it easy to use? And the second thing I said was, how does it look? And I'll get to the second point. So I think that's something that really, if you look at your sprinkler system or any gadget or a, a microwave or anything you have at home that's more than a couple of years old, you'll see how bizarrely hard it is to use. So one of the hallmarks at Virgin America, and it's kind of cool that it was 10 years ago that we thought of it, is the wireless ordering of food with the swipe of the credit card and non-acceptance of cash. And that was an idea that's a decade old and still isn't as prevalent as I thought it would be by now. So having told you that the website is not important, uh, let me come back to the website. This is your face. This is your living room. This is your front door. And uh, many carriers' uh, home pages look horrible. They look like war zones. It, it, it's, it's totally shocking. And they generate tension. Uh, I did that to myself last night just for fun. Uh, it seems like 30 or 40 departments say and think that they have a claim to be on the front page, on the home page. And frankly, I find that confusing and unpleasant, and I think it slows you down. The first Virgin America site was mostly white space, just a couple of little things here and there. And you could get your function faster, because we research what people need the most, and we prioritize that. Their new relaunch just a couple of months ago is also pretty sexy. Uh, and they use one of my favorite terms in business for 30 years now. Does it have cartoon-like simplicity? In fact, it does have cartoons, uh, literally. So I went to a large carrier yesterday and opened their website. Uh, and it's not any carrier being represented here today. But they had 26 fields, 26 fields just on the home page, including a button for buying a cruise. Now, how many people, when they go to an airline, buy a cruise on the first page? That is my, and by the way, the types, the, 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 the graphics were horrible. And all this is their introduction to the world. Hello, I am X. 
please step into my mess. Make the buying simple. Food, drink, ancillaries, tickets. Just do what I did, and I'm sure you do. Go to Amazon and buy something. Record every second of what you're experiencing, and then go back to your team and say, OK, either make it like Amazon or make it better. I doubt they can make it better, but if they can get close to it, it's going to be pretty good. So perhaps a bit radical on, on, on my list of advice these days and, 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 and what I think I would do, I would have a big, big uh, prejudice and resistance to installing backseat screens. Um, there may be moans and gasps in, in, in somewhere, but I wouldn't do it. I think everybody is moving very, very fast to live their entire life through their own screen. It can be a pad, it can be a phone, it can be a laptop, but that's how people are increasingly living their lives. They want their screen tailored to their priorities. We saw it just a minute ago. We actually saw it in the last two presentations. So I wouldn't put a screen in. Screens are very heavy. The wiring is insanely complex. They generate heat. They cost a boatload of money. And they break down. And they burn fuel. So take all that money and put it into broadband and streaming capacity which isn't perfect yet, it's far from perfect, but just in a couple of years, it will be, and then go to Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime and let them do the heavy lifting or Wall Street Journal Online, whatever. Just, I wouldn't bother with screens. It simplifies a lot of things. So merchandising, again, is something that's just on the verge of, 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 we've been saying it for decades. Well, we've got them in our seats. Let's just merchandise the hell out of them. Well, why don't they buy? as much as we think they should buy. Well, there's reasons, because it's not relevant. So I would forget duty-free, those heavy carts and the people trundling down the aisles, blocking the way for hours on end, selling you stuff uh, from a paper catalog. I'd, I'd, I'd take that off the plane. Many airlines have. More will. So I would forget duty-free on departure. I would buy everything online and have it ready when you step off the plane. Even better, and I'm sure services like this exist, but I think there's going to be some good ones coming, get a concierge that cultivates what you're going to buy. So whether you're going to Cape Town, or you're going to Oslo, or you're going to Shanghai, interact with this concierge on your flight. Tell them who you are. Tell them who your host is. Tell them why you're going. Is it a wedding, a funeral, a negotiation, a celebration of a merger? Why are you going? And then what your goals are. Tell them all that. And my bet is within an hour, and you have a lot of time on a long flight, my bet is they will have the perfectly cultural relevant gift in your price range in your hotel room when you check in. Pick it up, go meet your host, and the rest is history. I know this is a long section about the technology, but I think it's truly underrated. Design. This is a fun part. There's another area, of course, that we see is going through a great revolution, and I'm sure the person following me will say many more intelligent things that I have to say. But who would have thought a few years ago that you could fall in love with a thermostat or a smoke alarm? But you can, and you should. It's a company called Nest, and of course, they're from Apple. So my advice is never, ever, ever start an airline without a full-time design director from day one. It doesn't have to be a diva from any one of the famous firms. It doesn't have to be. We hired a young man from England straight out of Dyson. Brilliant guy. You want them full-time. You want them on staff. You want them perhaps to be a CEO direct report. I will always respect and even use firms like Genser, Anomaly, Landor, brand pie, and so forth. But nothing is re can replace the importance of a qualified professional who does nothing else in life expect, except speak your language, live, sleep, eat, and dream your design concept. Give this person power. No one, not even the COO, not any EVP, should be allowed to design a lounge, a seat, the lighting, plates, glasses, napkins, the website, menus, pillows, blankets, check-in counters, and boarding passes without design sign-off. Why do I mention all these things? Because I had civil wars over every one of these things in a list twice as long. Design is magic. The underlying fundamentals have to be good. But when you add design to it, it shows people that you care about how they feel. It's another expression of caring. and. Uh, and it shows that you care 
how they perceive you. Right now, there are plenty of airlines, sadly, that capture you, trap you, annoy you, and anger you, and then on top of that, cause retinal damage while you're sitting in their aircraft. That's really unfair, in my opinion. So the last section is people, something I could go on for hours or even days, but won't. Um, airline people are not unique, but they are among the people on the world who work more unsupervised than almost any other industry. This is a key fact, because I used to work for an old airline that doesn't exist anymore in places like Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and New Delhi. And this is also pre-cell phone, pre-fax, pre-everything. But it was great. I worked unsupervised, and I learned so much working unsupervised, but I could only succeed if I believed in the airline. If you're working in retail or in a factory floor, you're going to be supervised. Every single thing you do is measured, and it's spit back at you. FedEx drivers, the whole thing. But um, it really is a phenomenon to understand that people will act upon their beliefs, and we, you will not catch them in the airline business if they're not doing so. Good airlines tend to have good people. Bad airlines tend to have people who are indifferent and sometimes hostile. That's very sad. Note that I did not say bad airlines have bad people, because I don't think people are inherently bad, but they respond to the environment in which they live. So developing, retaining, motivating, and keeping a driven and happy team is about caring. Not showing that you care, not putting up cute mission statements, but really caring. People can tell when you're caring and when you're not. To me, as a person, it's about being present and available at all times. It's about communicating endlessly in which 51% of the time your radar is on receive, not on send. It's about listening. It's about showing your mistakes when you make them and taking responsibility for those mistakes and then telling people how you're going to fix it. It's about answering questions with the truth. I had more run-ins with legal and HR and uh, investor relations at the airlines I worked at than I care to recall, but I respected their agenda, and I had mine, and we found a way uh, to coexist. But people want the facts. They're so hungry for the truth. So decades ago, when I first had the chance to lead people, all I wanted to do was treat them mostly unlike I had been treated in the 10 years prior to that. So that was pretty uh, fun. And one thing about employee engagement that I'll never forget, when people start about talking about employee engagement, the first thing they say, well, whoa, 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 wait. What about leadership engagement? Because that comes first. You can't have employee engagement without leadership engagement. But the thing I read or heard, uh, and I'll never ever forget it, is when you start dancing with the bear, the bear being your employees, you don't stop dancing until the bear gets tired. I'll never forget that. Maybe it's well known. People are demanding. They have moods. They have opinions. They want to do things differently. But just be there from them. Really be there. And you'll get your investment back with interest. So in closing, I would say that starting an airline from scratch is something amazing. It's something complex. It's something inspiring and absolutely terrifying. I won't hide it. So if any of you see me trying again, track me down. Rafat can find me on my apple farm in Northern California and shoot me. <laughs> but just use a dart gun that keeps me asleep long enough to miss the pitch presentation. Thank you. <laughs>